Strange as it may seem, you can produce hydrogen from chocolate. It started off as a PhD project to synthesise hydrogen for other processes in the lab and in my PhD I had to show an application for the process and so I needed to find some industrial waste, uh, in this instance confectionery waste, uh, to show that it had some application in the real world. So how does it work? Here you have a fermenter with a confectionery waste. I've added E. coli and flushed it with nitrogen to get rid of all the oxygen. Under these circumstances, the E. coli convert the sugar in the chocolate to a range of acids, and then it converts one of these acids into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And hopefully it should work if we open this. Here the hydrogen comes out and goes into the fuel cell uh, where it generates an electrical charge fueling the fan. Impressive enough, but let's face it, the amount of power generated is pretty small. The next step is to see how easy it is to produce hydrogen from chocolate on a much bigger scale. We hope to take this from small scale in the lab to pilot scale to actually couple in the hydrogen production with hydrogen storage, with fuel cells and to produce an integrated demonstration system which can take in real industrial wastes and produce electricity. And we want to measure how much electricity can be made out of a tonne of waste, for example. In fact, all sorts of crops can be used, which is why Warwick's Horticultural Research Institute is also involved in the hydrogen project. We produce a lot of crop surplus in the EU and this could be an ideal way of using some of the crop surpluses or crops or foodstuffs that are actually substandard for food purposes can be used um, to make a valuable product rather than being just landfilled or thrown away. Presumably there are several ways of creating hydrogen. Oh yes, there are, there are several ways. You can use electrical energy, you can use light energy, um, you can buy it in a bottle even. But the thing about using biohydrogen produced by bacteria is it's clean and it's sustainable. And it's carbon neutral because the carbon was originally fixed by the plant that has been used up and by the bacteria making the hydrogen. Generating hydrogen is one thing, how you store it is quite another matter. That represents a major challenge. Uh, currently you would store it in a cylinder uh, at a high pressure or maybe as liquid hydrogen and that would be used in the space program for instance to launch the shuttle and so on. But these two methods do represent real practical problems when it comes to certainly comes to personalised transport, small-scale transport, cars and so on. The ideal solution would be to store the hydrogen in a solid form. And there are materials uh, that can do this very well. And I've got an example here of a bulk alloy. It's based on lanthanum, which is a rare earth metal, and nickel. And this material will absorb hydrogen uh, to a, a large extent uh, at room temperature and at modest pressures and it forms a very fine powder as a consequence. Now this represents a very attractive way of storing hydrogen. As well as storing hydrogen, Professor Kendall's interest is in turning it into heat and power. Hydrogen is a gas, uh, we can't see it, can't smell it, uh, it can't liquefy or solidify very easily by cooling, so we really we tend to store it in cylinders by press pressurising it maybe to 200 times atmosphere, pre atmosphere pressure and then keeping it in this heavy cylinder and then we let it out by opening a valve and the hydrogen gas comes out. Here is a, a little storage cylinder, at really at pretty well atmospheric pressure. So if we produce hydrogen by passing electricity through the fuel cell, the hydrogen goes into these little cylinders and you store it as a gas. But of course there's not much hydrogen in there, only enough probably to drive this little toy for five or ten minutes. This is a, a storage of hydrogen in butane. Now butane we all know as lighter fuel, cigarette lighter fuel. Uh, in a cigarette lighter it's a bit smaller than this but you can see the liquid fuel in there. Of course it's liquid because you've pressurised it and it's at room temperature, it's a liquid. As we open the valve here, and I'm going to switch this on, then the butane comes out, evaporates and starts getting red hot. You may see it getting red hot here on this catalyst and the fuel then goes inside the tube, there's some hydrogen in there, uh, and rather quickly this warms up, uh, gets to about red hot uh, and this uh, will drive the electric motor and we see it started to go around, we're getting electrical power and then we can feel the heat coming from this hot tube as well. So this is a, a combined heat and power device. And finally, uh, to get hydrogen into a liquid form you have to react it, uh, say to form methanol and you can store the hydrogen there very effectively. To get it out then, of course, you have to then 
break up the molecule, which takes a little bit of energy to break it up. But we can do that in a fuel cell like this. We pour the liquid in here. The, the liquid will then break up on these electrodes and produce electrical power from the methanol. That's fine, say, for powering a torch, but how about something bigger? A real car, for instance. One way to do it will be to use an engine. For example, BMW have a car which runs on hydrogen and petrol. So you can switch over and it runs on hydrogen. The problem is that the engine's not too efficient and also it has emissions of nitrogen oxides because it's getting too hot in the engine. If you had a fuel cell instead in the vehicle, and, and BMW were working on this as well, then that's much more effective. First of all, because the fuel cell's twice as efficient as the ordinary car engine, you get twice as much power for the volume of fuel. Secondly, because it's running cooler, you don't get those nitrogen oxides and pollution, especially sulfur dioxide, so it's a much cleaner system. Developing those fuel cells is Warwick's expertise. Fuel cell technology and battery technology, they're all different ways of basically using the kind of energy that's within the hydrogen molecule and actually releasing it into the system. I think the key is though in a controlled way, in a way that the operator knows how it's delivering the power. There are many industrial firms looking at the development of fuel cell technologies, which means that they wouldn't be looking at it if their time scale wasn't five to ten years. It would be too long on the horizon for them to be actually putting serious R&D effort into it. How broadly distributed it comes within, within our everyday lives, I think will we'll, we'll come on a mixture of things like cost and you know, will of both, this, both people and politicians and all those sort of things. But I would be surprised if we weren't seeing, seeing a, a significant impact within the next decade.